Hello, good morning and welcome to my talk about uh, sustainability and efficiency, environmentally friendly software development uh, with uh, KubiGreen. To start off, a little presentation of uh, myself. I'm Davide Bianchi, a senior technical leader. I'm uh, from Italy and I'm working in uh, Mia Platform. And uh, I'm uh, responsible for the product development in uh, Mia Platform. And uh, with this uh, job role, I saw how many resources can be wasted also in the IT industry. Um, what is the agenda about this talk? Uh, we will talk about an intro to sustainability, uh, the sustainability in the IT industry, with uh, some example and data about uh, how many resources can be wasted, can be used by IT. Um, a little discussion about green software and how we can make uh, green software during the uh, software development. We will talk about uh, Kubernetes and more in detail how to reduce the consumption of energy and reduce the emission of carbon um, dioxide using Kubegreen and some conclusion and uh, takeaway. Okay, so uh, it's important to say that the sustainability is not only about uh, environmental realm, it's also about economic, uh, social and uh, environmental realms and uh, all of these uh, create the sustainability. And uh, in the IT industry, uh, uh, an example of uh, environment uh, with the sustainability is, uh, for example, the open source in my point of view, because uh, there is the needs of economic sustainability in open source. Uh, there is the inclusion of where there are communities and all are welcome to contribute uh, so there is also the social part and uh, this uh, community uh, help uh, to create better software and to re uh, reuse uh, the software. So there, there is also from the environmental point of view uh, an improvement. Um, as part of my involvement in, uh, in, uh, in the open source, I created the KubiGreen. KubiGreen is a Kubernetes operator with the aim to reduce the carbon footprint of our Kubernetes cluster. And uh, we will uh, see more in detail later. And uh, it's available on GitHub uh, at the link uh, github.com slash kubigreen slash kubigreen. Okay, environmental sustainability in uh, IT. How we are using resourcing in IT? The consumption derives from the compute, so the use of CPU and GPU the storage of data, the networking and the manufacturing and so creation and the disposal of the hardware of the server, the transporting of server from factory to the data center and the cooling equipment, for example, for the server in the data center. Um, so we should take in mind that all we do online run on a server somewhere so also the code we write once uh, released on a server consumes energy and produces carbon. Uh, let me take some example of consumption in IT, some really big example. Uh, the global electricity demand of the IT industry is uh, about 1, 1.3% of the global final electricity demand. Uh, with an emission of 330 million tons of carbon. These are big data and uh, um, in, these, uh, in these numbers are not uh, counted the, um, the mining of Bitcoin, for example, and other cryptocurrencies. So the electricity demand of the mining of Bitcoin is about the 0.4% of the global final electricity demand with an emission of 68 million tons of carbon equivalent. This means that around 2% of the global electricity uh, demand is used by IT industry. But let me see, uh, let me talk about an example much more smaller. Smaller, something that we use every day in our working and private life, the email. Uh, 
Uh, what is the environmental impact of sending an email? A standard email um, uh, produces a carbon, has a carbon footprint of 4 grams of carbon and this is without an attachment. If we add an attachment, we will arrive to 19 grams of carbon. And in average, every person receives every day 100 email. This means that every person in one year uh, produces 150 kilos of carbon, uh, which is more or less uh, like driving a mid-sized car for 1,000 kilometers. So really interesting how uh, sending and receiving email can uh, impact on our environment. But how can we reduce the consumption of energy? Well, we, we could uh, not use software <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's our work, so it's quite difficult to, to not use uh, software and uh, it's, software is more and more important in all working environment and uh, also in our private life. So the real question is, uh, how can we create more sustainable software? There is a practice called the green software and uh, it's important to, to say, as the first thing, that uh, there are some groups of uh, which already talk and uh, um, contribute to spread the word about the green software. And uh, here I take a couple of examples. For example, the Green Software Foundation, which mission is to build a trusted ecosystem of people, standards, tooling and best practices for creating and building green software. And for example, also the CNCF tag of environmental sustainability, which goal is to advocate for, develop, support, and help evaluate environmental sustainability initiative in cloud native technology. For example, the CNCF tag on environmental sustainability in the past month, in October, organized a sustainability week with meetup all around the world, and it was a really interesting um, week. And there are also some uh, on YouTube some uh, meet, um, some video of this uh, meetup. Okay, but what is green software? Green software is a carbon efficient software, meaning it emits the least carbon possible. And uh, there are three principles of the green software: the energy efficiency, the hardware efficiency, and the carbon awareness. Let me talk about energy efficiency. It's important to say that. The, energy is derived from the, the use of fossil fuels, so uh, from coal, oil, natural gases, and so on. So use energy uh, produces carbon. So to, um, to create green software, we should reduce the, the energy consumption of our software. And uh, for example, when we architect um, an application, we should think about the, what, the, what is the correct number of microservices of our application. So for example, if we have an application of, uh, with 100 of final user, it's quite uh, useless to create 100 uh, micro different microservices because maybe in the future we should scale we should think about maybe uh, create better code to scale in a second moment if, if uh, it's needed. Uh, write efficient code, so use performant programming languages, uh, effective uh, algorithm, and also uh, ef efficient uh, framework. Optimize the data handling, so optimize the uh, transmission and the storage of the data and use new and more performant hardware, for example, the use of ARM architecture, which is less energy um, consum uh, consumption of energy. Okay, um, let's uh, take the second principle, which is the hardware efficiency. Is important. Uh, there is an important definition of uh, the hardware efficiency, which is the embodied or embedded carbon which is the amount of carbon pollution emitted during the creation and the disposal of a device. 
how can we reduce the embodied carbon? There are a couple of uh, strategy. Extend the lifetime of uh, the hardware. So this is called amortization. And uh, for example, if we need 4,000 kilos of carbon to create and dispose a device, a server, if we use this, this server for four years, we have that the amortized carbon is 1,000 kilos of carbon. If we use this server for five years, the amortized carbon is 800 carbon for every year. So extend the lifetime can reduce the, um, the impact of the, of the hardware. The other strategy is to increase the device utilization. So for example, um, it's better to use only one server at full capacity rather than five servers at 20% of capacity. This is because of the cost of the embodied carbon. But why we sometimes use five servers instead of one? This is to respond to the peak capacity. And it's one of the biggest advan advantages of the public cloud. Because in a public cloud, if we need more resources, we know that we can have, uh, we can have it. And uh, the last principle is uh, the carbon awareness, which is uh, do more when the electricity is clean and less when it's dirty. So use more electricity when it's coming from lower carbon sources like renewables. How can we do something with a carbon awareness in the real life? There are also in this case two different strategies the demand shifting and the demand shaping. The demand shifting is uh, uh, move our computation. For example, we have to uh, run a workload to, um, for a machine learning model. Uh, we, we could uh, shift spatially this, uh, this workload to a region which uh, has um, a lower carbon intensity so that we reduce our uh, emission of carbon. But it's not always possible to move our computation to another region. So there is also the temporal shifting. So for example, if our model needs some data, which uh, we, we cannot uh, move around the globe, for, for example, for regulation uh, uh, or other things, it's possible also to maybe to take the temporal shifting. So uh, shift to another time during the, the day or night when the carbon intensity is lower. Uh, the other thing we can do, it, do with uh, the carbon awareness is the demand shaping. So instead of moving the demand, change the demand based on the carbon intensity. It's uh, by theory, it's quite easy. It's, if the carbon intensity is low, do more in application. If the carbon intensity is high, do less in application. In the real life, it's not so, so easy. But there are a couple of uh, real life examples we already have. For example, the eco mode of our appliances, uh, or uh, in, also in software with uh, the um, streaming software. Um, uh, the software quality is changed is um, changed automatically based on the bandwidth. But uh, we can also uh, introduce this carbon awareness in our application. There are some uh, examples. For example, we can reduce the performance of, of an, our application with, when uh, it are using some, uh, uh, some dirty energy. But what it means to uh, reduce the performance? Uh, we cannot uh, uh, reduce the performance of the final user, but maybe, yes, we could. We could, for example, uh, put a button inside our application to let the user choose and uh, switch to an eco mode uh, usage of the application. Or maybe our application is, uh, for the final user, it's the same if, um, uh, our application API responds in 30 milliseconds or in 10 milliseconds. Yeah, in this case, we can reduce the performance when the energy is dirty and uh, 
uh, go to full power when uh, the energy is clean. Okay, we have now seen some, um, some rules, some uh, best practices about uh, the green software, the uh, sustainability in the IT industry. Um, and let's now see inside the Kubernetes environment and in Cloud Native. And uh, let's start with an application example, an e-commerce website, which has some traffic surges. So during product launches, sales event, and so on, traffic can surge significantly. So the resource demands can vary. Uh, it can vary through the day, requir requiring more resources during peak hours and fewer during low traffic periods. And the solution is quite uh, simple, is in Kubernetes, it's possible to use the auto-scaling solution with uh, the HPA to uh, address the traffic peaks and uh, to reduce the number of uh, workload during quieter times. Okay, auto-scaling is based by uh, some, some metrics such as uh, usage of CPU, usage of, of memory and other custom metrics, and the important thing is that the auto-scaling is not only about uh, upscale, but also about downscale. So when the resources are, un are unused, are not necessary, it's important also to downscale the application. And this has repercussion both on cost and on environment, because the first driver to reduce the our uh, emission, uh, our energy consumption is uh, to think about to reduce the, uh, our cloud cost because cost in cloud and energy are strictly related. So in a first time it's a, a good driver, the cost, and uh, when we optimize the cost we could think about only the sustainability point of view. Okay, we have our application and uh, we should uh, uh, develop this application and create a new feature and so on. To do it, we have a pro one production environment and a lot of non-production environment. We have testing, development, UAT, um, Q&A and so on. These uh, non-production environment for, uh, are used uh, during the working days, so for more than 75% of the time in a week are unused. What it means? It means that also if they are unused, uh, the server in idle uh, consumes some energy um, because also has some CPU and some memories needed also in idle. And we can address it with Kubegreen. Kubegreen is an open source solution which runs inside our cluster. It's easily configurable with this configuration. For example, in this configuration, we say that the weekdays are from Monday to Friday, one to five. At 19, turn off all the pods inside our space and at seven, in the morning, turn on all the workload in our new space. It's possible to, to exclude some references and so on, but the, uh, the important thing is that at sleep time, at scheduled time, uh, our workload are stopped and restored. Okay, how can we use uh, Kubegreen? It's really simple. Uh, it's needed to install, uh, is a QCTL apply of uh, one uh, file, uh, only one file. Configure the sleep info inside the desired space and uh, see Kubegreen in action at the scheduled time. So it's really simple, there is a tutorial available on the Kubegreen website and uh, working on kind, but it works also on all the Kubernetes installation. Okay, so let's now see some real life usage. Uh, we have some chart. This is a cluster of 15 namespace and three of them have Kubegreen installed. We can see that there is the five peaks that are the 
uh, working day and five uh, slope that are the night and a uh, larger, larger slope, which is uh, um, the weekend. And we can see there is the action both of uh, memory usage and uh, of memory request inside uh, the cluster. The same, uh, this is for the memory, the same is the CPU. The reduction of uh, the request of CPU is uh, uh, a reduction of the allocation of resources inside our cluster. So this is another uh, cluster we have in, uh, in the platform with uh, 75 in space and 48 of them with the Kubegreen enabled. We can see that there is uh, every night 600 pods are, um, are turned off with a reduction of usage of memory of 33 gigabyte and reduction of use of CPU of 3.5 core and also the allocation, so the request of memory is reduced by 45 gigabyte and of CPU of 25 core. So a, a really interesting reduction in the usage in the allocation of resources inside the cluster. And with this cluster, with the, the uh, cluster autoscaled enable, means that every night, the four nodes of this cluster are turned off with um, a reduction of both cost, energy consumed, and uh, some uh, carbon not uh, emitted. So it's quite uh, interesting to, um, to see this chart because there is a, more or less a 30% of saving in uh, cloud cost. And uh, some uh, Final note of uh, Kubegreen, some data on uh, the Kubegreen controller. There is an interesting number of adopters which already use uh, Kubegreen. Uh, some of them are listed on the Kubegreen website, but there are uh, a lot of other users which are not uh, listed uh, here. And um, there are more than 200,000 downloads of the Docker image. And, uh, Talking to our users and uh, uh, by uh, our uh, um, matrix, we can see that there is a reduction of uh, at least 30% in cloud cost uh, with the consequent reduction of uh, emission. So really interesting uh, uh, results. Okay, to conclude, some uh, key takeaway. So sustainability is important also the, in the IT. We already see uh, so in, um, in the first day at the keynote and also today uh, at the keynote, there is a, a talk about sustainability. And uh, it's important to think about it in all the software life cycle. There are some groups uh, which can help to you to create uh, some green software. So there are uh, Slack channel and so on. You can talk about these, uh, these groups. There are also very interesting uh, open source project to help to measure and to reduce the, um, the energy consumption. For example, uh, here there is uh, Kepler, which is a really interesting open source uh, tool. Uh, the environment sustainable transition could start thinking about the cost savings in our, um, of our application and uh, in Kubernetes environment it's uh, possible to improve the energetic efficiency using uh, Kubegreen. Okay, I hope you enjoyed uh, this talk and uh, thank you. and start the Kubegreen repo if, if you want. And uh, if there are some questions. Nope. Okay. Hi, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, Thank you. I wanna ask if all the hyperscalers, assuming they will someday uh, go and switch to like clean energy, solar energy. Does this will mean that we don't need to s uh, save on the resources? Uh, yeah, it's a safer of uh, resources, but the resources, uh, 
the, the solar uh, and the wind and the other renewables uh, um, are not uh, used uh, at the moment uh, so, um, so largely. So um, very often we, uh, when use, for example, a data center or a um, cloud provider, we are using both renewables and uh, fossil fuels energy. So reduce the energy, energy consumption needs that means that uh, those 2% of uh, energy used by IT industry ca can be decreased. So there are more renewables energy used by other, uh, other uh, industry, for example, which needs more energy and it's quite more difficult to reduce the consumption. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.